Okay, so uh, today is uh, March 22nd, it's 5.20 p.m. and this is the Public Safety Committee. Um, uh, the first item on the agenda is a motion to adopt the agenda. Um, I would move to adopt the agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jane. I'll, I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed, we have an agenda. Um, we do have this nagging issue of these two um, minutes and we have them both posted. Maybe the best thing to do, Jane, since you're here is um, move the ones for the 15th. And if Soraya comes on for the eighth then we'll deal with those after, but just so that we can at least get one of them done, if that's okay. Absolutely. So I would move to approve the minutes from Tuesday, March 15th. Uh, that's great. I will second that. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And we have those minutes. Thanks so much, Jared. And thanks um, for to Thomas as well. Um, I have not looked to see, um, Jared, are there members of the public that are here? No, not at this time. Okay. So given that, we can... Um, we can uh, open the public forum and then just close the public forum as there were no members of the public. If there are, end up being members of the public, then we can go back or they can speak during the, um, during the discussion, um, which leads us to the event of the day, which is the uh, continuing CNA report. We, um, uh, we had gotten to uh, section six, at the last meeting, um, we did it very briefly so as to get that done. Um, but I know that Zariah had wanted to potentially be able to revisit. There were only, I think there's only two items in section six. Um, and then we had decided to do section six and seven and nine tonight, um, mostly because that way we could just do eight all at one time. And that will be at our last meeting on the 28th, which is next Tuesday. Um, so I guess probably the, um, oh, and there, and, there, and there were two other things I just also wanted to mention before we get to that. Um, the first is last night, the Board of Finance and the Council approved um, the spending of $1,500 out of the Council Initiatives Fund in order to have all of our meetings posted um, on Town Meeting TV to their YouTube channel. So they will be extremely accessible. Um, and uh, that passed unanimously by the council. Um, and then um, the other thing also is that I will try very hard to get a, um, a draft of the uh, report that will go to the council and to have that done by the 28th, 29th, it's right before the end of March um, so that we can have that to get to the council before the end by, by March 31st. Um, so as far as section uh, uh, six, um, I don't see any more changes to it. Um, if there were if there was anyone who wanted to give some input into section six, we can revisit them on. Um, what these relate to are patrol operations by geographic area. And there were just two recommendations. One was to continue to adjust patrol assignments and determine resource allocation. Um, and then the other was to develop a deeper socioeconomic bias analysis by area that includes a review of the type of incidents, response times, demographic data of officers, victims, and suspects as well as community feedback. Um, and don't know if anyone would like to be able to speak to that. That was what Zoraya had wanted to revisit. Um, and I know Mila was with us last, um, last week, as well as Jane and Nick, if there were others, and also the chief and or Oren was also there. If there's anyone who has anything they'd like to add to those, then we can incorporate those as well. Uh, if not, um, I th think 
trying to remember exactly how that, how that, what we had, I don't know that there was anything that was really discussed other than, um, let's see, oops. Uh, I think what we had left, the last conversation that we had left was just simply that, um, you know, we were obviously in agreement. The first item isn't really a recommendation, more just a, an observation that we would continue, obviously, that we would, that would be a priority, but not, it was really not really a recommendation per se. Um, the other was more of a discussion because that revolved around um, the need for data. And that is an IT issue. Um, and um, I think the way that we had left that, trying to remember how we left that at the very end. Um, uh, I think it was more just simply that that was a goal based on the fact that we don't have, um, you know, a tremendous amount of resources at this time, given the number of officers, but that this was an opportunity to use um, uh, non-sworn personnel um, and as well the Hoots model that will be coming on on um, they'll be coming online this summer. Um, Milo, maybe you can refresh my memory, um, please. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we talking about six point one point two? Well, that was where we had left. That was where we had left things. We sort of had discussed it, but Soraya wanted to be wanted to revisit that. So I wasn't really sure exactly where we left that. Do you sure, remember? I um, not completely. So I, I just wanted to, to clarify, um, I am always for more data rather than less. And I think more data will definitely help, uh, policing and allocating resources throughout the city. But there is in terms of a resources issue, um, the police commission has been told in the past that there are certain limitations with regards to staff um, regarding uh, people who, uh, the individuals who work and put together these data requests. And so that is certainly something that needs to be looked at by the city because I feel without resolving those issues, it will continue to put us um, at a disadvantage in terms of making um, progress. Um, the, the department needs to be willing to look at more data and um, the city needs to provide the resources uh, to make sure that the data is provided. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, um, maybe in the interest of time, we can come back. Um, we can come back to six if, you know, if Soraya has other things she wanted to add, and then we can continue um, with seven. Um, so I, I have to, you know, I, I have to confess on the, in, in section seven, um, there are, there's, a, there's, I don't know, I guess about 13 maybe or so um, recommendations. And I, I don't know how others felt about this. I had a, a tough time going through this, um, mostly because I'm, I'm just not well enough informed to know um, how many, um, you know, for example, how many case detectives are needed, how many, um, you know, intelligence, uh, uh, you, know, um, uh, uh, you know, how many sergeants and police officers are needed for crime suppression. Um, or, I mean, the only thing that I personally had an opinion on was the domestic violence prevention officer. I saw that as incredibly important and that we not eliminate the position. Um, but I was at a bit of a loss to know what to say about the other things. And I'm, I'm wondering maybe if there are others that have you know, more experience with this, uh, perhaps just simply an opinion, um, you know, and I mean, 
I wasn't really sure how to go with that. I don't know if others did as well. Um, Jeff, I see your hand. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, you can see that I've I have a common thread in section seven. Um, you know, the business community marketplace um, was kind of kept out of this discussion early on, for whatever reason. Um, I think if we were involved, everyone would have a better understanding of what uh, we have to deal with the business community, you know, our visitors, um, everybody that comes downtown to enjoy downtown. Um, we've got a lot of negative behavior we're dealing with. And, and now retail theft is ratcheted up. It's, it's everywhere. It's really horrible. And, you know, CVS Pharmacy called me, their landlord. I've got one store out of 10,000 and they call me because they have a problem in their store both inside and outside. So, you know, if, if that's, if those are the kind of calls that are coming in from retailers and all these retailers and restaurateurs hear from their customers, and it's, it's rather very, it's very discouraging to see what's going on out there. And we just need more officers in downtown patrolling on a daily basis. So, and, and, and then I think Karen, you're right about the detectives you know, probably need more detectives. Um, with everything that the CNA report is asking for and suggesting, the workload on Burlington Police Department is gonna increase. Now, maybe that's not officers per se, but it looks like it would increase the workload for officers as well. So, you know, definitely, I think we've gotta go back to staffing levels that we had before um, this all started, so. Those are my thoughts. I don't know. Maybe for the maybe Jabu or Milo. I mean, you have much more. Well, how wonderful! I see both of you have your hands raised. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, or actually, Jabu, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Go. So I. So uh, scheduling and how the schedule is is kind of a shape is a fully bargained uh fully bargained um uh thing i'm sorry i can't english today for some reason uh and <laughs> with, with that being said like i'm i very much I would, I would love to see a different different staffing model but i think before we can get there um i think the further for the as we integrate newer uh new cslc CSOs and with the coach model i think over time it'll be much easier to change the schedule once we see kind of how these things kind of take things off the place of the, the, the sworn officers. And it might also have better buy-in buy once the coolest model is uh, implemented and see how that works out. But either way, though, this, can be, this is a bargainable um, action that will require a lot of buy-in from the officers, which, from my understanding, one of their biggest perks is the current schedule. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I have nothing else to say. Okay, um, Milo. Um, thank you. So along the t uh, lines of what Jabu uh, just mentioned, I, I agree with some things because we, with regards to the staff, the current staffing level, um, some of these recommendations, it, it, it's whatever the department can do right now and also um, meet the needs of the officers. So the, you know, previously we had had a, a, our previous chief say that, oh, the shifts are too long and that's why some mistakes were made. But talking to officers, they really love the current shift structure so that input is really important because that's that's part of um, you know a, a job perk for for lack of a better thing. So uh, uh, better reason. So uh, for the first two seven point one one and seven point two one, um, I was really given the staffing issues um, and also the city council vote um, that be. PD is really the ones to to weigh in on these areas. And then with regards to some of these others, uh, there were some that I was I was able to agree on. And then there was some 
where I wanted clarification on certain positions and um, discussing the ramifications. Like, do we actually want to get up to the point where we do have nine detectives again because of the increase in drug activity? Um, I wanted uh, some more information on 7.51. Um, I wanted some more information on the domestic violence prevention officer uh, and what that officer uh, did, because I think the position might currently not be filled or even was eliminated. Uh, so I'd like to get that clarified so that I have the proper information. Um, and, you know, what did that position do that wasn't, I guess I'd like to know that all officers know what they need to know about domestic violence and responding to it. Um, and some of the others needing more information, which I guess we can get to as we get to each one. But just in general to respond to Mr. Nick, um, regarding previous discussions, this goes back to, and I've mentioned this when I can to members of the business community, there is no effort to keep business, the business community out of discussions. We need the business community to be aware of when discussions are happening so that they can actively participate. Um, and I can, I'd be happy to, to have a, another conversation with him about that, but I just want to be very careful about trying to say, Oh, we, you know, conversations pushed out the business community. This goes back to the business community really being more informed on the issues as a whole in Burlington, because that affects how the overall community feels. And, um, you know, when they give feedback to the people that represent them, decisions can be made that can affect um, not only the downtown area, but other areas of the city where they're also other businesses. Um, and I know some businesses are not going to want to hear this, but I would like, I, I'm not sure with the increase in retail theft, with I, which I acknowledge is a problem. It's not only a problem in Burlington, it's a problem in Vermont, it's a national problem. Um, we see a lot of areas that are even experiencing these extremes, um, you know, snatch and grabs where they're literally in broad daylight just people going in, smashing windows, grabbing stuff, really coordinated stuff. So this is a national problem. And businesses as a whole have to look at their loss prevention strategies much deeper than they've ever probably had to before. And they have to say, what can we do within our businesses to reduce this? Because the fact of the matter is you, can, you, you can't have a police officer inside every business with retail depth it's the prevention has to start with the business it's officers arrive after uh can they get descriptions of people can they look at camera footage things like that in terms of prevention stopping something before it happens it's really up to especially the larger sizes and and the, the drug stores you know maybe they're going to have to go the route that a lot of drugstores go. When I go outside of the state of Vermont, I rarely go into a drugstore or, or pharmacy, CVS, Walgreens, et cetera, that isn't paying for their own security. Like it is very routine to see security guards in these stores when you get outside of Vermont. Um, so really looking at a loss prevention strategy, that's, and that may be su something that the business community needs uh, for, to be supported in, you know, needs to have ideas. Um, but to, to expect a uh, placement of police officers to be in the quote unquote right place at the right time to actually prevent retail theft, I don't think that's quite frankly very realistic. Um, it's, it's in some ways, it's like bicycle theft. You can't put a police officer next to every bicycle in the city of Burlington. People have to have a personal uh, prevention strategy in place um, 
to make it more difficult for their bicycles to be be stolen. It's it, so those are just some of my thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Jeff, I just want to be, before I get to you, I did want to acknowledge, Hannah, I, I saw the comment that you had, and I and I would like to go back to that. Uh, um, so if you can just give me a, a minute, um, we'll let Jeff respond. And, and, and let's just please try our best to make sure that we continue moving forward. We only really have about an hour, and... Um, you know, and try and are trying are trying our best to get through section seven if we can. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, I won't belabor this. Um, I to, to to address Milo's comment about the business community's involvement. I did reach out via Zoom to a few of those meetings you may recall to, to see it when we were discussing this and asked to be included. And for some reason, we were not brought into the discussion. So that's that. As far as loss prevention goes, yes, CVS can afford to, and Walgreens already has hired their own security people. For the small mom and pop merchants that we have largely, the ones that we really value, they cannot afford. And, and they have retail clerks, young female clerks in the store. They are not equipped to deal with the retail theft that they're seeing. So yes, we need officers on the street. That's the deterrent in and of itself. So we need, we're, we're, we're paying a huge amount of taxes. We, we, you, you took away, you defunded the police 30%. Our taxes never went down. And everybody's beside themselves down here. The small mom and pops, th these boutiques are, are really struggling with retail theft. And it's very concerning when you have somebody coming in, just ripping off stuff off the shelf and putting it in a bag and leaving. And when they do try to stop them, oh my God, the threats they get, it's, it's really unnerving. So more officers on the street is certainly part of the strategy that we need to employ here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so Hannah, I saw the comment that you had on section seven and I don't wanna ask the question for you, but I thought it was a, a very good question. And we have the acting chief, we have Detective Byrne who's here, and I don't know the answer, so I'd be interested as well. <laughs> yeah, and I do just, and I just send it out to the to the email thread, but um, I just wanna say 7.7.1 is supposed to be disagree, uh, autocorrect takes over, and then the 7.78, um, 7 7.8.1, geez, um, is also supposed to say disagree because, to the next to the comment, I guess tentatively to that. And I just want to make that clarification. Um, anyways, yeah, so that question, and I think that you're uh, referring to the one on uh, in unit for special investigations. Um, are you referring to that particular question I put with it? Well, you had you had two questions, and um, the first one was about was on 7.1.1, um, which I think is an important issue um, um you know it sort of related to to some degree i think to just simply officer wellness um, yeah. and you know you don't have good you don't have good officers if officers are burned out yeah so the reason why i asked that question is like yes that um but also it's like you know anybody that works in the public especially in stressful situations if they hit burnout not only like putting the risk to the people that they're trying to support, it's putting a risk to themselves. So I'm just curious, like I know, um, you know, staffing is a concern at mitigating burnout, um, but I'm curious about what current steps, what are the desired steps um, for that? And then I can always get to my other question on the 7.8.1 when we get there. But yeah, that is the reasoning behind that question. Okay, so... Um... If the, either the chief, maybe this is more a question for the chief. I, I, um, do you see that question? Or perhaps you can just simply respond to what Hannah had just asked, if you're able. So, I mean, issues around staff, you know, the, the way to, to minimize staffing uh, stresses is by having adequate staffing. Um, and how that's created is, is what we've been debating for the past uh, two years. What we haven't done is, is come close to creating it. So at the moment we have 
At the moment, we have you know fewer than uh, fewer than sixty effective police officers, and and from those come all the ranks and all the things that we do, and that ends up meaning that we have about twenty two on patrol. That's more than fifty percent down than it has been in the past, and that is an untenable situation with regard to uh, to officer exhaustion and overtime and burnout. And although we have started filling in some other ranks around it. Um, none of those positions does all the things that a police officer does. So as we look at these, or at least as a, that a police officer did, um, and so as we look out uh, at the role, we're in a spot where we're, we're just trying to figure out how to make, as to do as much as we can with what we currently have. We've been doing that over the past two years now, almost two years. Um, it's going to get tighter this summer, uh, and then at the you know simultaneously we need to try to rebuild, but the rebuilding process is going to take much longer than the than the the, uh, the creative destruction that basically happened uh, with regard to trying to find new ways of doing things. Um, I guess too, um, and thank you so much for the for for that response um, and providing that information. I also like am thinking about because you know we are taking the steps. The cap was raised um, in October, um, so hopefully those steps will be taken um, based on uh, the response that you provided. Like that is the desire. That is like what the police department says that they need for adequate support of their staff. I'm curious though because even with staffing levels going up, considering. Um, Quite frankly, the type of society that we are living in, the cultural aspects of it all, the fact that uh, higher poverty rates tend to lead to higher rates of like mental health issues and um, you know substance abuse issues and um, really anything that can cause further duress in in a community, which is what public safety is set to address that type of impact on the people in public safety can be really heavy. And so I'm thinking too, and that's why an answer may not be able to be provided today, but what is the 10,000 foot view and desire for addressing burnout um, as we are looking at ways to, to better public safety for all in this city? Um, and to me, that includes those who work in public safety, because even before um, staffing levels dropped, there was still burnout. There's still burnout that exists. And so that's why I'm asking the question as well, is because I do want to think about that bigger picture in the future, because to me, that is a huge part of adequate and successful public safety. And I understand that there's like no response to that right now. Um, so anyways. Well, there there were a couple of things that were mentioned. One has to do with the notion that, that raising the cap as happened in October means that instantaneously or even rapidly the number goes back and it doesn't. It takes years and years to hire police officers and to actually grow any police department um, absent some sort of extraordinary expenditure on so, recruitment and advertising efforts. And with sorry, I just want to interrupt you. I think it's, I'm sorry. Really, really quick. I want to interrupt you because I just want to correct that that assumption that that's where I'm coming from is not correct. I know, okay. I just want to make that clear. I know that that's not how it works. Um, and I just want to make it clear that I know that's not how it works with any sort of recruitment for any type of staffing. I'm more so talking about when you do get to that point what other steps are we gonna be looking at to adequately support those in public safety in preventing burnout? That's a great question. That's a terrific question. And it's one that is uh, difficult. It was uh, officer wellness, officer safety and wellness was pillar six of President Obama's uh, 21st century task force on policing. Um, it is a pillar that is one that there are a lot of different answers to. And a lot of those answers are frankly kind of superficial. There are discussions about morale boosting efforts or uh, efforts uh, around, um, I mean, officer safety is something that can be accomplished with regard to technology, better equipment, better training, more time for training. Officer wellness is a little bit more complicated. Do you have good peer support? Do you have uh, warning systems for officers who are showing signs of stress? 
And you're right that even before uh, the headcount began to rapidly diminish, there were people who experienced burnout. But there's a, there is a big difference between experiencing burnout because you're passionate about the work or there's a really tough week that happens versus what has essentially been for, for most of these officers 19 months now of constant stress along those lines. Um, and so, uh, and, and amounts of overtime that are, are far, far greater than they've ever been uh, requested and required to do. So um, that is, is a great question. How do we address that? When we finally get to a point where we are staffed in a way that's a little bit more robust than we are now and can start thinking about saying, okay, we can take a breather and we can actually back off and it, it's not all gonna fall apart, what are we gonna do for those officers who are in that place? Because right now what we have is officers who have been running full speed for months and months and they're not getting weekends off. Uh, they are frequently coming in long before their shift and staying long after their shift. Uh, and this isn't uniform. This is in, in New York City after 9-11, there were no weekends. Everyone did 12 hour, seven day a week shifts for the next about seven months after 9-11, it, it tapered off. But the first three months, now that is different than we are. I'm not claiming that we're there. Officers do have weekends, officers take their time off, but they also are coming in far, far more often than they ever did. And they're doing it in ways that are more stressful because they are required. It's one thing for an officer to say, I'm gonna voluntarily sign up for noise patrol in the Hill section that's co-funded by UVM in order to deal with party noise. And I'm going to pick to do that on a weekend that works for me. And I'm going to choose this Friday because I don't have anything else going on. And I'm going to make some extra money for whatever I want to spend that money on. It is different that than it is to say, you must come in this weekend. And it's not about a noise patrol. It's about regular staff work on a shift because we don't have enough people. And if you're not there, we don't have enough people. And there, there are those are two very different stresses. So how are we going to uh, you know, confront that and address it and then hopefully find healthy ways to deal with it once we have that pause? I don't know. And that pause is, is unfortunately a year or more off because although we are going to make efforts at recruitment and growing again, we are going to lose more officers than we bring aboard in the next, continuing for the next year. Um, and there, there's, there's no recruitment plan that can overcome what we, we've, we've hired essentially two officers since October. And in that time, I believe we've lost seven. So, or I'm sorry, three officers in that time and we've lost seven. So we're gonna to continue to see that for, for the near term, the next several months. And then your question is a wonderful one and a really meaningful one. Thank you so much. I just wanted to, I, I'm a huge fan of asking questions. Y'all might have noticed it with um, my responses on the spreadsheet. Um, it's because I wanna gather a better understanding because I don't like to make essentially give my opinion without understanding the background. So thank you so much for providing that full background. And yeah, I also like to plant seeds with my questions. So I really hope that when that time comes, that seed is planted and that will be taken up with that. Thank you. Um, so I know you had your hand up and then you took it down. I don't know if maybe you got, you got busy and needed to go elsewhere or if you wanted to add something to that. Uh, no, I was going to kind of just veer back on to um, just the assessment in general and, you know, how I think it's flawed. But I think Commissioner Grant had her hand up, so I, was, I, I just want to give her the opportunity to respond to the chief before I was uh, going to take us off track. Uh, well, I mean, you know, we're happy to hear what you have to say. I mean, we can all, we'll just all have to take turns. If you wanted to add something, we're happy to hear it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't mind if I'm... Um, just again, though, if Commissioner Grant wants to talk about officer welfare, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to listen to that. My, my kind of a, uh, point is it's going to be long-winded, I'm afraid, so I, I don't mind yielding to Commissioner Grant until so she gets her, her point out. Okay. All right. Milo, go ahead. Um, I'll just be rapid fire. Uh, definitely support officer wellness. Uh, the police commission actually... Um, a few months ago had a wonderful speaker talking in detail about that. So do encourage people to uh, review previous police commission meetings uh, for that speaker, as well as many other speakers um, that talk about um, the things that are going on, how they affect officers, and also how 
um, this affects the community as a whole. So really looking at things in a, a holistic way. Be happy to talk to Mr. Nick about uh, engagement regarding businesses. I uh, was personally attended um, almost all the um, Talitha groups to stakeholders, uh, one of which was business. And um, I'll just say, I said it then, I'll say it again. Business owners have to be really aware of what's going on in Burlington, especially if they don't live in Burlington. So that means I have to be willing to watch our city council meetings, uh, other commission meetings, and, and have a understanding of what's being said in the community. This idea that they have to wait to, to be um, invited that that's not true of anyone everyone has to make a decision that they want to be part of the process um the, you know the door is 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 not closed uh, and then um i had something else that i am forgetting so i'm just going to uh yield to um Warren to uh, make his comments thank you okay thanks a lot Warren, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, just in regards to the the number that CNA um, kind of went with, yeah, I, I just have some, you know, on the union, we we just have like some serious reservations about how they how they came up with how they they landed on that number. Um, I understand the formula they use, like the rule sixty, it, it makes sense. The saturation index makes sense. You know, we disagree with the discretionary the, the allotted discretionary time that they uh, calculated. And um, it really comes down to, you know, the, I, the data that they used was inappropriate and it came up with a flawed result. When you look at what the data they used was, they, they, they used CAD RMS data. So for people who, who, don't, who don't know what that is, like a CAD RMS is a computer aided dispatch record management system. It, it's, it's a computer program that aids dispatch in assigning officers work. And then the records management system Basically, basically, just it's 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 a place for officers to compile um, their reports and you know evidence for their investigation. But by no means does it capture an officer's work product or investigation. Um, just to give like one one, I'm really sorry, it's a long a long drawn out example, but it kind of really speaks to the point. Um, I went to a I had a crime last year and it was reported on the twentieth of a month. I, the crime was basically uh, somebody smashed into a car and they robbed the content. They stole the contents of the car. I was dispatched to it. So the CAD RMS basically started the timer as soon as I was dispatched. It recorded the time that I was on scene. And then within that time, I started that investigation. Uh, there was another similar crime reported that, you know, it kind of led me to believe that, you know, the same individuals did it. The, another car was smashed into and the contents of that was stolen. That was captured in CCTV, our um, security footage outside of Walgreens. Uh, we got a pretty good description of the su subject and direction of travel. They went into the marketplace garage, which has like a bunch of cameras there. So our dispatchers were able to see the car that the, the two suspects got in. Uh, the car left. I uh, then got another, as I was going to the second crime scene, a call came out uh, down at Shaw's, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Market 32, where somebody was trying to use a credit card that wasn't theirs. And when they reported the name on the credit card, it was one of the victims. So, you know, myself and a few other officers went down to Shaw's. We are uh, sorry, Market 32, couldn't find the, the suspects in Market 32. So we went to Shaw's where the car was located and the two suspects were in, in close proximity. So I recognized one of the suspects as somebody I, I dealt with before. They had a warrant for their arrest, so they were taken into custody brought back to the police department. The other suspect uh, turned out to have a suspended license. Um, the rules of criminal procedure allowed me to take that person into custody and bring him back to the police department. I wasn't able to hold that suspect, uh, the person with the, the criminally suspended license. I wasn't able to uh, lodge him in, in, in jail. The rules of criminal procedure didn't allow me and I didn't have enough evidence gathered to kind of like, you know, prove all the felonies that, that uh, I suspected them of committing. So he was released on a citation to appear at court. I knew I could change the charges at a later date. So that's why I like to do. The other suspect, he had a warrant. So he so they had to go up to uh, Northwest Correctional Facility. That alone is a two hour 
trip, or sorry, a two hour round trip, you know, approximately that much. I got back to the city and then over the next eight days, I basically just investigated the rest of the, the, the elements of that crime. I researched other similar crimes in the area. I found uh, approximately five, I believe it was, five crimes that have been committed that day, but report to other officers. I contacted all those victims, uh, arranged interviews. I watched hours and hours of security footage. Uh, it turned out the car was stolen, so that they were operating. So I contacted the uh, victim of the stolen car. Uh, those victims came in, uh, they retrieved stolen footage. I got more interviews uh, to like further support uh, any elements of the crime. And then I compiled all that evidence. I figured out that there was probably that there was approximately 28 crimes committed. And then I wrote 10 pages of affidavit. And eight days later, I submitted those charges. However, if you look at the CNA analysis of the CAD RMS system, that that investigation that took me, you know, eight days. And then in those eight days, I was taking other calls. I was feeling other calls of services. And by my discretionary time, I was investigating, you know, this, these other 28 crimes. The CAD RMS system that CNA says uh, that used to calculate the number of officers says that from start to finish, that investigation took me four hours and 45 minutes, and I completed it all in the one day. So that's, it's kind of just an example of how flawed using that data was. And, you know, by no means am I alone in in, in this type of investigations, like officers routinely go to a call. As soon as the work that's needed to be done on scene is finished, we go back in service. And again, the CNA are saying, now we have discretionary time, but it, it, it does not take into any sort of uh, consideration how much time we spend documenting our reports, investigate, or sorry, documenting our uh, efforts, investigating our crimes, you know, nothing. It literally just captures time on scene, time off scene. You know, there's there's an awful lot that was missed in that data, which came, which kind of like resulted in this, you know, number that is, it, it, you know, my, in our opinion, you know, really under under staff in the department. So that's my long winded explanation there. Um, if I could hop in after that, um, and I appreciate um, the detail, I have noticed something that concerned me because I'm not really sure as much as it's a CNA issue, as much as it is how we uh, track or don't track certain activities. Um, an example I'll quickly give is on a ride along, uh, officer kept himself in service while also following up on a case, right? So we lose that information. And the reason for doing that was kind of a reflection of, of the shortage in terms of not wanting to put himself out of service while he did this follow-up visit regarding a particular case, um, just in case something came in that required more immediate attention. So I think that needs to be looked at and then uh, follow. There was a kind of additional conversation about um, a number of different types of incidents where um, officers are doing a significant follow-up, but it's, it's not captured. Um, it, it, so that, that's definitely an issue. Um, and that is definitely something that, needs to be looked at in terms of how are we, um, what can be done to, to improve capturing all of that information? Um, is the current system underused? Is the current system, um, you know, is it is it adequate, or if it's not adequate, uh, what are the the you know what are the options of improving it, or is it just a a symptom of the current staffing levels and officers feeling the pressure to keep themselves in service as much as as possible, so that these these follow ups that they're actually act out there actively working on um, aren't being being tracked in the way that we need them to be tracked. Thank you. Uh, we have Jeff, then uh, Zariah, then Oren. Go ahead, Jeff. 
Um, I was thinking about this, and then Oren gave um, his recap of a, of eight days and what he was up to, and you know what the CNA report is asking of the police department. Just hearing what Oren goes through, you know, I, I got to believe it. And we're not experts here, most of us. So, you know, we've got to really rely on the police department and in the administration and Chief Murad to tell us if we want all this done. What is it going to take? What is the staffing level? We, we, we really can't understand what the staffing level is. I think it's got to go back to where it was before all this started or, or more because we're dealing with so much out there in terms of drugs and th theft and everything and the homeless population. And, you know, but I think we've got to rely on the, 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 uh, the department to tell us what. And then, of course, it's going to come down to what city council going to approve for a budget. So for us to sit here and say we need one more of this and three more of that is, I don't, I don't know if that's a, a worthy effort. I think we got to really help this department maybe prioritize where we should go, but to, to pick and choose the numbers, I don't think we're we're you know, we're capable of that. Okay, Soraya, how are you? Haven't seen you. Haven't seen you in a few hours. I I think maybe about twelve. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Um, sorry. Yeah, I think on the, I guess the first, because I guess I'm confused as to why we think that doesn't, why we think that the CNA method didn't capture it with the 60% method, because I guess my understanding was, and this is just from a consultant background, it's like, okay, for the call hours where you're active, you've got so much time, and then you've essentially got like, a little less than half of your time that's overhead or that just, I forget the word that they use, discrep not discrepancy, discretionary, discretionary. Um, time. So um, are we just saying that that 60% assumption, we just don't think holds or that that, I, I guess, it wasn't to me that they were saying only the time on call counts. Um, and then I just had a general, I don't, I missed the first two minutes. So I don't know if there was a start to this or people, if there was a question that prodded this, or we just started talking about stuff. But I did also just want to talk through, because there were some recommendations in the CNA report that weren't numbered as recommendations. And I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss those. Um, and they were kind of in section, or at least I put my comment between 10 and 11. Um, I don't, between, are you talking line item or are you talking like the record? Sorry, set between 7.10 and 7.11 because it was on packet. You're not allowed on the table. Okay. Um, on page 87. And I just want to make sure we go over it. And I'm just going to briefly summarize them. But there was a recommendation to change to make some changes around false alarms. So either doing something around the ordinance and or having more proactive false alarm programs and or exploring double verification. And then the second one was around vehicle accidents and changing our response to those because there seems to be a thought that we spent a lot of time on false alarms and vehicle accidents that didn't have sufficient property damage or injury to warrant police response. And again, I think okay. that, was, that was not, so those were not, for some reason, those were not put on unless they're part of something else. Yeah, um, no, they didn't list them as numbered recommendations. They just said, we recommend as a, in a paragraph. Okay, huh. All right, I get. I did not see those either. Um, well, the where we are now, just so you know, Zariah. So we we started a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know if you got that email, but and you may have other things you needed to attend to. Um, we we started by you know I had said you know section um, section seven. Most of the items that are in section seven are bargainable. We started so, at five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay. That's all right. So, um, you know, what we, the way that's the, was sort of the way that I started it and said, you know, Hey, listen, these are, these are mostly bargainable issues for myself. I struggled with 
completing this section mostly because of the fact that, you know, I just don't know enough to know whether we're, in, you know, how many sergeants we need or, you know, whether we need eight detectives or nine detectives, you know, that, that to me is sort of a bit of, you know, a bit of something that's well, but that, I mean, that's just, just items that are well beyond my purview. The only thing that I had a specific opinion about was the elimination of the domestic violence officer position, which I don't agree with. Um, but other than that, and so I'm sort of, was sort of the way this sort of started out was, and why we haven't really specifically talked about one item is because they're all in the same bucket of their bargainable issues. Maybe the the best way would be to go around and just talk about the things that we think are more important than less important. Um, but I, I so I'm I'm sort of open to suggestions if you have an opinion about how to best proceed. Yeah, and it's I didn't I just copied in my recommendations with what um, the chiefs were, and I guess to me it's not that none of this is important or worth talking about, but I do wonder how relevant it is before we get the BPD staffing back up. So I would personally be okay with the exception of some of those recommendations, which I think are not that like they're about. They're related to the problems with staffing or like staff load, but they're not, and maybe they put them in section eight, I don't know. Um, but with the exception of the ones that I just called out, I'm, I think there's, I, if, I guess we could pull out some of the ones that were like, oh, this is important right now, but I almost would say for a lot of the other ones, I would be okay saying let's, uh, I don't know. Sorry, I'm talking and thinking out loud instead of having my thoughts prepared. Um, I do like there's some things where it's like, is this worth asking for flexibility on in the contract? But I also don't know enough about like, you know, if in three years a lot has changed, if it's worth just going back and negotiating some of this separately. Um, so I think a lot of these are irrelevant until we get the staffing levels to what is currently allowed. I would tend to agree with that. Um, Oren, did you have your hand up again? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, sure. answer sure. Uh, Councillor Hightower's comment about the, the rule of 60 and the discretionary time. Um, just going back to like my, my, my example of all those crimes that were committed, you know, as a police officer, I'm obligated to, uh, you know, it's my job. I, I, I would say that I'm, you know, it's my job to investigate those crimes. So if, if I have to investigate those crimes, you know, the time I spend investigating those crimes is no longer discretionary. So therefore, like, the, like you know, by definition, I, I have to do it. So I don't have discretion whether or not I do it or not. You know, I'm, I'm doing it because it's my job. So with, with that in mind, like the, the, the data that CNA pulled from, you know, the CAD EMS, it didn't capture, you know, my my full investigation. It only captured when I was, you know, I got to the first call and I finished transporting uh, mm -hmm. the suspect up to up to correctional facility outside St. Albans and came back. That's it. All that other all that other uh, investigation, you know, wasn't wasn't recorded by the the CAD EMS. Like that's that's not the function of of the the, the CAD EMS. Um, so just kind of. Throw that, throw that out there. Uh, the data that that they used just, you know, wasn't wasn't appropriate for what they were trying to measure. And from speaking to officers at the PD, I don't know of any officer who was observed by CNA to to understand how we work and 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 you know how we use our CAD EMS. It just it, it didn't happen from what I can see. Yeah, and I don't, I I I I don't know. Sorry, can I? Can, is it okay to keep going, Karen? Sure, of course. Yeah, I guess I don't, I guess my understanding of discretionary wasn't that you get to do with, well, like, you're not doing your job at that time. It's, you know, you're following up on, you're like making decisions about rather than having an immediate thing in front of you that you need to respond to a call, the 40% is discretionary in terms of you're deciding like, oh, I'm now going to take this time since I have, no calls right now, these 30 minutes to, you know, follow up on this thing or like write this report. 
is that not that's I, at least is that I not just, what discretionary means to you no not 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 to me discretionary time would be I have completed, you know, any paperwork that really needs to be completed. You know, my discretionary time is I'm going to do foot patrol. I'm going to try to do like proactive work, like traffic enforcement. You know, if, if I have an investigation to do, you know, I, sh I should be doing my investigation unless I'm directed, you know, like bar clothes and say, traditionally we would have had a lot of officers downtown at bar clothes and because we like to, you know, the proactive presence, you know, deterred, uh certain well at least uh, the, the presence uh was seen as to turn certain amounts of antisocial behavior so you know in that sense i would uh you know that that, that would be in discretionary time where my my investigation would have maybe taken a back step to you know having to be down at bar closing because a uh, sergeant directed me but now investigation we have to do investigations so therefore you know, it's not it's not really discretionary that you know we we conduct an investigation we don't conduct an investigation if the investigation has to be done we have to do it um and then but there's a difference between the investigative unit and the patrol unit or at least a cna lays it out right i i i can you just rephrase the question are, are the, the statement i don't understand oh yeah it the, C, the, uh, the, the person from CNA who did the staffing assessment is a former New York City Police Department person. And there are clear delineations between investigatory roles and uh, patrol roles there. In fact, if you are a patrol officer, there are lots and lots and lots of functions that you will never get to do unless you leave patrol and move to a specialized unit. Because there are 36,000 police officers and all of them end up in some sort of specialty role uh, or unless they're on patrol. And patrol is, is everything that's not a specialty role. One of the most astounding and impressive things that I found coming here was the degree to which the men and women in the department do multiple, multiple roles and all wear multiple hats. It is true that we have a detective services bureau. And the case that Oren just described is a borderline detective case with regard to the complexity of it and the fact that it is going to pull them away from patrol for a certain amount of time. But it's not a detective case. A detective case is one that we refer, and those include burglaries, those include uh, you know, uh, assault and robberies, certain crimes of violence. Um, there are also mid-level crimes, especially around patterns. At a different time, Oren's crime might have been, if, we, if we'd attached it to a pattern or a series of automobile thefts and automobile, uh, or thefts from automobiles, it would have gone to our street crime unit which uh, the staffing analysis recommends we, we uh, recreate or, or uh, assign officers to again, I would love to. We are years away from having sufficient resources to do so. So um, the, the, the majority of officers have cases like the kind Oren just described, where they end up with something that is relatively large and requires a lot of follow-up work and additional kinds of, uh, of, of investigation. But not the kind of investigation that would cross the, uh, it's not a bright line, but the line that separates our detective unit from the requirements of the road. That's not the case in much bigger agencies where officers really are not allowed to do that kind of work. In, in New York City, for example, the anti-crime team has a very specific delineation that they can only do investigations of up to three hours. So if they get to a crime scene, they are called to a crime scene because of a robbery. They can canvas the neighborhood and do an investigation for that suspect for up to three hours, after which point they have to remove themselves from it and turn it over to a detective unit. That's not the case here. Some of what Commissioner Grant said with regard to her ride along and observing the ways in which the CAD is or is not uh, used is accurate, but it's more than just the CAD system, which has limitations. It's also a cultural understanding inside the department that people when they are not directly engaged in something, go 10-8. 10-8 is the call sign for saying that I'm no longer directly engaged, I'm available to take more calls. And you never want to be not 10-8 unless you're literally working on something that is of that moment. All the things that, Bur that Officer Byrne described are things, once he's done with that transport, he comes back and then he says, I got paperwork to do, but I'm not 10-7, which means I'm here doing paperwork. I'm still 10-8 because I can get up from this computer in my cruiser or at the desk and immediately engage in a call for service if necessary. And I don't want to be the guy who leaves my coworkers hanging by not being around for calls. 
That is a cultural phenomenon in the department. It's an admirable cultural phenomenon, and it was absolutely discounted by CNA. Um, then I have one more question, which I'm probably going to leave just because I need to figure out how to phrase it. But I do, I guess, Karen, want to hand it back to you and also ask the question on, given that we, like, how do we want to proceed with what we do want to prioritize and what not. And then the only thing that I want to fl flag again is those kind of recommendations that aren't. Not yeah, we, we definitely need to go to those. I mean, I, my, you know, I mean, I do tend to agree with you, Zariah, that, you know, until we are in a position where we can even discuss these kinds of things about, you know, the, these different staffing recommendations that we, um, and we, can, and we can try to prioritize them. They're all bargainable. Um, not sure that, you know, between now and the next contract that those are going to be the priorities necessarily. I think there's a lot of other priorities. Um, I mean, I'm happy to try to give that a shot if people want to go and, you know, if there are certain things that are a particular priority to people, we can acknowledge them. The other thing we also need to remember is that um, made a, made an agreement that we stop at 6.30 because there is a police commission meeting at 6.30 and two of us are gonna have to get on that. Um, Milo, if you can, if you have a brief comment, I assume you have your hand up. If you have a brief comment, why don't we do that now? Uh, thank you. So um, I disagree with the word discounted. I think that CNA worked with the data that they were given. And um, there was an opportunity to give them more data or to discuss the limitations of the system, capturing this extra activity uh, that officers were doing to be proactive to work other cases while keeping themselves available for calls. I think instead of constantly trying to criticize the report, we just have to take what we have and move forward. And one of the things that the department's going to need to think about, and I'm, I, my strongest recommendation, is how to track this information because it's it's too much missing. And I accept that that's an issue, but I don't accept that that's the fault of CNA. Um, the and I, I will leave. I will leave it at that. I, I I think there could be a whole discussion on what we do to capture this type of missing data. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. So, um, Soraya, why don't we? Why don't under the committee conclusion for the for for really what is all of section seven is that um, recognizing the current level of staffing, um, that um you know, we feel there the, 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 the single most important issue um, at this point is to, um, is dedication to the rebuilding plan that the chief will be bringing forward shortly um, as per the press conference that he had with the mayor a couple of months ago. Um, and that uh, uh, you know, the committee supports um, more data um, and supports, um, uh, uh, you know, a collaborative effort with the recommendations of the CNA report, as well as the, um, you know, the, uh, as well as finding ways, better ways to track, um, you know, to track uh, officer activity and, um, you know, when call, when, when officers are on duty and responding to calls, um, and I think maybe at that point we can sort of leave it at that. Um, is there anyone who has any challenges with that basic 35,000 foot um, conclusion? Um, I made one small edit, which says we feel the single most important issue is dedication to rebuilding the department for the current cap of 79 sworn officers. That's okay. Right. All right. And in addition, and in addition, you know, incorporating over the next, whatever, the next two years, um, the non-sworn officer model um, and, and crisis response, meaning Kahoot. 
patients. Um, uh, and then we can, you know, I don't remember, maybe what we'll do is maybe we, maybe the thing to do is just, I'll go back and look at what those things were. You said they were on, do you remember now what, what page that was that you yeah, said? Yeah, it's page 87 to 88. Okay. All right. Um, I think probably in the interest of time, we probably, just because they're, you know, the, the last section of the report um, is probably the easiest one to read because, it's, I think it's rather impossible not to agree with all the recommendations. Um, basically, what we're talking about is community policing strategies, um, you know, and embedding community policing in BPD culture, um, working with community members to set up recurring opportunities for engagement. Um, I don't know if anyone had any general comments about this section, there are five recommendations. If there were anything that people didn't feel was a priority, or if there was anything that anybody wanted to speak to on those, either one at a time. Um, I know we only have a couple of minutes, but just in the interest of trying our best to get through that section, were there any, uh, uh, were there any comments that anyone had on section nine that we should we should talk about and try to incorporate into the committee, the working group's conclusions. I don't know if it's fair to give any section, even if it is an easy one, five minutes. <laughs> well, it's, it's only easy because of the fact that, you know, I, I don't know that anybody would disagree with it, but if we, if we take, if we take each one at a time, the first one was, um, the community uh, policing strategies, including some of the engagement activities, um, allow for positive relationship building. I mean, I don't know that that's really a recommendation. It's really an observation. Um, uh, the others were about, you know, about the, um, uh, uh, you know, consider redefining community-oriented policing, what that means. Um, I know the, the chief had put down that you felt that, that was, these things were done. I wasn't sure how, you know, I, sometimes it's hard to say that they're done. It sounds like to me, they're more ongoing. Um, would that be your assessment, chief, that these are really ongoing community engagement initiatives? Uh, I mean, for anything like this, where you do have to continue to do it, yes, I would, I would concur that those are things we are, we want to continue to work on. Um, we're, you know, I think that there are, uh, for example, I think that, that we did have community policing. I think that our ability to do it now has been drastically reduced. Um, I think that we do uh, have ways to, uh, engage the public and involve them. Um, I, I, it was very, it was wonderful that this meeting began with uh, the very proud uh, acknowledgement that there had been a vote from the council to televise these meetings going forward. Police commission meetings have been televised uh, as long as I have been here in Burlington. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's those steps and that's not to say that those steps can't be improved upon. Um, Again, uh, I think that, that my notes on these uh, were, were relatively clear on the idea that these are things that we do want to continue to do and, and work on. Um, it even says we want to, we're placed to do this and continue and broaden the effort with regard to 9.3.1, for example. So, and the only one that isn't a done or a fully agree is just because there's this mess, that, this idea of a new strategic plan that doesn't come up anywhere else in the document and just gets dropped in there. And I'm I'm not keen on, on promising a strategic plan based on 9.2.1. Otherwise, it is something that we're working on. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. I mean, I know there was the visioning plan that we talked about in section one, but I, I didn't remember a strategic plan being mentioned per se. Um, Jeff, I, 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 um, go, go ahead, please. Just real quickly, my only thought here is to maybe call out that the business community be involved as well. I mean, it says community, but I think by pointing that out that the business community is a valued partner here, I think that should be included. Thank you. Great, duly noted. Thanks, Milo. 
And then I know you've got to both got to run. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, going back to the previous discussion, page 64. So on the screen, we're only showing the actual recommendations, but there are aspects in the report that um, review the methodology in detail. And um, in addition to information that isn't what isn't tracked currently, um, there is noted that unfortunately the BPD was not able to retrieve actual staffing information for the period we studied. Um, so instead of using actual staffing data, we relied on the number of officers scheduled to be assigned to patrol during those time periods. So there's there's estimates that they had to make because they didn't get data they needed from the department. With regards to community engagement, uh, this is something that for anyone who's listened to me talking about issues with our department and our community uh, since I started really becoming more involved uh, with this, going back to the committee to review policing policies, what the department has thought in the past was engagement is, I'm not sure it was really sufficient because in certain parts of our community, engagement was lacking or really needed to be looked at differently in order to be more effective. So I do believe there needs to be a strategic plan for engagement. I, I don't believe that we have to wait for the department to be fully staffed because I think there are things that can be done now um, to improve engagement and um, you know, we're running out of time right now, but I, I mean, I would like to know what the department feels they lost before. And then also just, just different things that we can literally be doing right now to, to increase the awareness throughout the whole city. Because once again, we need to be looking holistically, all of us, no matter what area we come from in terms of being stakeholders, representing uh, different groups, we all have to be thinking holistically, not thinking in a holistic fashion, not taking into consideration what was happening in all the communities in this city has brought us to where we are now. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So, all right. So here's where, why don't we, why don't we do this? Um, I'm going to try to make a note of exactly what it was that we left off on. We will continue section nine when we when we talk next week on um, uh, if it is okay I'm, I'm actually sort of looking for a show of hands would people prefer to start at 5 p.m and go to 7 30 or would people prefer to start at 5 30 and go to 8 and i think if we do that then we have a pretty good chance of finishing the report so all those in favor of five of five to seven thirty, raise your hand. All right, and those who are in favor of the five thirty to seven five thirty to eight, are those are there those that would prefer the five thirty to eight? I'm raising my hand for both because I have no preference on either one. <laughs> are you raising your hand twice? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I think Oren is more in favor of the 530 to 8. Um, I am. I'm the same as uh, Commissioner Gamash either way. Okay. Um, Chief, do you have an opinion? Do you have a, pre a preference? Actually, if I oh, can jump I in. If we could do five, just because I have a work obligation at six, so I might have to hop off. Um, that would be preferable to me. My so like sincere that. apologies. I need to log off to start, yes. to start out of the police commission meeting. So <laughs> no worries. Now. Great. No worries. Great Thank seeing you all. I run. Thank you. And I'll see you next week. Okay. Thanks so much. So um so we'll start at five um and we'll plan on five to seven thirty. Um and um I think we'll be I think we'll be good with that. Hannah, is that okay with you? Yeah, I just gotta jump off at like six fifty-five because I'm I um I have to set up my volunteer meeting at seven. Yep. So, but like five would work better, so I'm here longer or okay. a bit longer. Wonderful. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so uh, so we'll, um, there weren't any members of the public that joined us, were there? No, I don't think so. No, we didn't have um, any. The only other thing since Soraya is here now. Yes. Yes, I remember, I remember. Okay. Zariah, we need to approve the minutes of March 8th. Um, would you be, um, you and I were the only two that were there. So we approved the ones for March 15th because Jane was here before. So are you okay with a motion to approve the minutes of March 8th? Move to approve. Wonderful, so I'll second. And um, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Um, so you've got your minutes approved for the 8th and the 15th. Um, no worries. Um, we'll adjourn the meeting at 634. And um, Soraya, are you going to have a few minutes after if I call you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you, Warren. Have a great evening. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Good night. Get some rest, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Good night.